Hey, you know, when we sing those words of the songs that we sing, we, we work hard at picking words that are beautiful, that are good, that are true theologically. I want to read that chorus to you again that we just sang. <clears throat> I put my faith in Jesus because he's never let me down. He's faithful through generations. So why would he fail now? Those words are so good and, and they are so true. But to be totally honest with you, and I always am honest with you, and sometimes I'm pretty vulnerable with you, sometimes I'm not, but usually there's a fair amount of vulnerability. Um, we sang those words three or four weeks ago, and I was really struggling. I was really struggling, um, meaning those in my heart. I knew that they were true in my head, and I knew that they were true in reality, but my heart was really struggling with those. I, I shared with the staff uh, and on our elders um, I felt like I was in a, a position where just a thousand paper cuts were putting me to a slow death. I felt like I was drowning and I, I couldn't get my head above, above water and with some leadership stuff. And um, I've been way, way, way in more difficult places through worse times by far, but it just was hitting me hard. And, uh, and I don't know why, but, but like I've always shared with you, one of the reasons might be is because the way God has worked in my life, it seems like every time I'm preaching, whatever we're preaching through is what seems to hit me and what God challenges me with. And we've been preaching about learning to trust Jesus in all circumstances, that he is sovereign, he is in control. And I was actually struggling a bit there. And the message over and over again that we've been hearing in Daniel is that there is a God in heaven. He is in control. He is sovereign even when the bottom drops out. And my bottom wasn't dropping out, but I was struggling. And so as we sang those words, I'm like, I know this is true, but my heart is, is really struggling. You know, as we've been looking in the book of Daniel, we see God's people severely tested. And that message that we've seen over and over again in this book so far is there is a God in heaven. He is control in control. But sometimes we have a difficult time following that truth. On a day-to-day -day basis, when it's easy or when it's really hard, uh, where are you putting your confidence? This morning, as we get into Daniel chapter 6, once again, we're going to be encouraged in the scriptures to put our confidence in God and the gospel instead of putting confidence in ourselves. And this confidence in God, not in self, is really what our souls need. That's, that's the rest for our soul. Now, the last two weeks, what we've seen is we've seen uh, men privately putting confidence in anything and everything other than God. We've seen pride, pride that goes before the fall of these great kings of Babylon. But today we're going to see a man, Daniel, once again, putting his full confidence in God. And it will look bold and brazen, and it is. And some might misinterpret this to see, seem kind of arrogant and, and prideful, and it's not. But we see that Daniel's confidence is in God no matter what and not in himself, no matter what he's facing. And what we're going to see is Daniel once again, this idea, there is a God in heaven. And we're going to read that in the scriptures this morning. Now, something to kind of prime the pump a little more. This idea of having confidence in ourselves is something that most of us crave, but in reality, that ends up going nowhere. And what we're going to see in our passage again is that our confidence really needs to be in God. He is the one that will not let us go. He is the one that is faithful. He will never let us go. So that's kind of a, a little bit of a, a background as we get into it. If you have your Bibles, which we hope we always do, bring your Bibles. Get into the Word of God with us. We'll have it on the screen, but we'd love for you to be in your own Bibles. Uh, we're going to be in chapter 6. I'm going to start in, in verse 1 and just read it. And like we normally do, we just kind of go verse by verse. We go through the text and see what God has to say to us there. Daniel chapter 6, verse 1. It seemed good to Darius to appoint 120 satraps over the kingdom, that they would be in charge of the whole kingdom. And over them, three commissioners, of whom Daniel was one, that these satraps might be accountable to the commissioners, and that the king might not suffer loss. Now, last week we saw, if you were with us, and if you weren't, in the previous chapter, 
that this kingdom of Babylon that had been reigned by Nebuchadnezzar and several other leaders and then Belshazzar is conquered by the Medes and the Persians. And this fulfills the prophetic dream that King Nebuchadnezzar King Nebuchadnezzar had had, and Daniel had interpreted that King Nebuchadnezzar's kingdom was great and wonderful. There was a statue made of different materials, and at the top was his head made of gold, and that was King Nebuchadnezzar's kingdom. And last week we saw that kingdom got decapitated. The head came off as the Persians came in under the leadership of a Mede known as Darius. When he was 62 years old, he defeated Belshazzar and now they take over the kingdom. So in chapter six, we see now King Darius getting his kingdom organized and we see good leadership, good organizational leadership. That's not the point of this passage, but we see that, that he sets up 120 rulers underneath them, and then three commissioners over them, and he's just getting things organized as a good leader would. Kind of makes me think about Moses when he's leading Israel out of Egypt, out of slavery in Egypt, and, and he is leading millions of people, and they're coming to him for decisions every day, and Moses' father-in-law Jethro comes along and says, hey, you're going to burn out if you keep going this way. These people aren't being cared for because there's not enough of you to go around, and you're going to burn out. So why don't you set up leaders of hundreds and thousands and, and get organized? And it was a really good leadership move. Leadership, very important. Again, the passage is not so much about that, but just a little side thing here is that here at the fields, we endeavor to lead well. We endeavor to be organized. We endeavor to have leaders over leaders. Our structure is such that, that we have our, our elders, both paid and unpaid, those elders or pastors, synonymous term. If you're an elder, you're a pastor. You're a pastor, you're an elder. They service the congregation by leading through loving service, leadership. And then we have community group leaders who help shepherd the flock. And then we have our service team leaders who help run teams like our ushers and, and our meals and, and our setup and teardown and all that. We organize division of labor is good. One of our values here at the fields is participation, sharing the load. Many hands make work light. And we value that here at the fields. And that is so important. And not just for the protection of your pastoral staff, but it helps with that too. I mean, coming out of COVID, you know, pastoring is not always easy. And as you guys know, your jobs are not always easy. We had a lot of teachers, public school teachers quit. A lot of medical people quit after COVID. Well, I've been around a lot of pastors and there are a lot of pastors that after COVID, they were just done. They were burnt out. You know, it, leadership is hard. So you got to organize for that. That's what Darius does. We, we value participation here at the fields because it's biblical. And a great question to ask is where are you contributing? Where are you serving? Where are you, what team are you on here at the fields to get this job done? Well, Darius is setting up his kingdom. He's organizing it. And this is how he sets it up. 120 satraps and then three commissioners over them. Verse three, then this Daniel began distinguishing himself among the commissioners and satraps because Daniel possessed an extraordinary spirit and the king planned to appoint Daniel over the entire kingdom. Now, Daniel, of course, because God was working in him, we've seen this already in this book, he's doing very well. He's excelling and the king notices him and is going to appoint Daniel over all of it. Kind of, again, reminds me of another Old Testament story of Joseph. Joseph, who was a slave in Egypt, rises to the top because he's got a good work ethic, but more importantly, because God is working in him and he rises to where he's second in charge just below Pharaoh. Well, that's what's going on with, with Daniel here. Pretty interesting. And there's a testimony to Daniel and his service here. When you think about where he came from, okay? He was a youth that was taken captive when King Nebuchadnezzar came in and conquered Jerusalem and tore it to the ground and burned it. Takes these young men captive into Babylon, probably killed some of Daniel's family. We saw a few weeks ago where Daniel was made a eunuch, which is a horrible thing, all at the hands of this evil King Nebuchadnezzar. And yet, what do we see in Daniel's life? Integrity, trust in God. And he serves this evil king so much so that the king promotes him and promotes him. 
So much so that we saw a few weeks ago that Daniel had compassion for this evil king that had done such horrible thing to him and his people, and yet he has compassion for the king. So Daniel serves really good over here. Now this kingdom is conquered by the Medes and the Persians, and now Daniel's serving really good over here too. You know, if you want to put it in modern day terms, uh, Daniel serves the Democrats really good. And then when the system changes, Daniel serves the Republicans really good. How in the world is that possible? Because Daniel is serving the true king. He's serving the king of kings. He's doing his work unto the Lord. And that's how we can thrive and, and survive it and be a good testimony that we understand we're working for the Lord. And that's what Daniel is doing. And he's rising to the top as a result of that. And we need to keep that in mind today because once again, we're going to see Daniel between a rock and a hard place. The king's demand will come in direct conflict with Daniel obeying God. And Daniel's going to have to choose at this point, once again, do I obey God or do I obey man? Now, Daniel served his secular bosses really, really well, such that he rose up. But sometimes there's a point where it's like, no, oh, I just can't do that. I've got to obey God. It's a good, good, good example for us and a challenge for us, and super important to note as we get into this passage. All right, so Daniel is excelling in this new administration, but we're going to see jealousy sets in with the other leaders. Look at verse four. Then the commissioners and the satraps began trying to find a ground of accusation against Daniel, against him in regard to government affairs. But they could find no ground of accusation or evidence of corruption. Inasmuch as Daniel was a faithful man, and no negligence or corruption was to be found in him. Now we saw back in chapter 3, if you were with us, the jealous pagan advisors uh, rat out three young Hebrew men, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Uh, the, the king had called everybody to bow down to his statue, and they were not willing to do that. And that led to what is known as the fiery furnace situation, where they were thrown into a fiery furnace, and we know how that turned out. Uh, God delivered them. He didn't have to, but he did. But here now again, we see the same thing. Jealous people doing anything they can to get righteous people who are excelling well to get them in trouble. You know, we, uh, we, we worked hard to plant a lot of churches in Australia and New Zealand, and my wife and I, we've, we've been down there a lot and, and actually lived in New Zealand for a while. And there's something in that culture called tall poppy syndrome. Any of you guys ever hear, hear that? Okay. No, okay. What it is, is when you see a, a field of poppies, if one is higher than the other, so kind of standing out, um, in tall poppy syndrome, what they do is they cut it down. Okay. You're not supposed to excel uh, uh, amongst the rest. Okay. It's a kind of an egalitarian thing. And so if you're in the classroom, the teacher asks a question and nobody raises their hand, but you do, you get shamed by your classmates, okay? You're not supposed to excel above the rest. They want to pull you down. Now, I don't know if they do it surely out of jealousy, but it's a cultural phenomenon in Australia and, and somewhat in New Zealand. Here, these, these other rulers are obviously jealous of Daniel and his success, and they're going to do anything they can to knock him back, even if it means getting him destroyed, getting him killed. And it's really sad. It's so blatant. Folks, don't be surprised. If you are endeavoring to serve Jesus well, and, and by God's grace, you're excelling like Daniel or, or these other Hebrew young men, you're excelling well, don't be surprised if people get jealous. Don't be surprised if people try to cut you back. Okay? That's just sometimes... What sinful humanity does, it comes with the territory of, of trying to serve God well. Well, they're, they're looking for something to find an excuse to get rid of Daniel, to accuse him. But notice there in the text, it says nothing sticks. No accusations will stick. If we can put the verses back up there again. No ground of accusation. Okay? No corruption. No negligence. Okay? He was doing his job well. Folks, I know, I can guarantee it, because I know my life too, and I'm probably not too different than you. 
I know for sure that if we put your life under a microscope, something would stick, wouldn't it? It would, okay? Either something against what our bosses want us to do, or our neighbors, or for sure something that God's called us to do. Uh, we're not impeccable, okay? Uh, most of us wouldn't have the kind of righteous life that Daniel lived. That's our aim, but dirt would come out. You know, as, as elders, as pastors of the church, one of our qualifications is to be men who are above reproach. But none of us are perfect. To be above reproach means what's your re reputation in the community? And because of the gospel, what it means is when we do blow it, and every one of your pastors blows it, amen? Just look at me, right? Let's hear a loud amen. There we go. I'm feeling the love, all right? The gospel means when we do blow it, what do we do? We confess. We repent. I repent to my wife. I repent to my kids. I repented to you guys. I repent to God. If it's true, I need to own it and apply the gospel to my life, okay? Now, Daniel is not perfect. He's not sinless, but he's got a good reputation. The accusations are not sticking, and that's a testimony to the work of God in his life. He was a faithful servant, and there was no negligence or corruption found in him. And that's a testimony to God. It points Darius to God. It points Nebuchadnezzar to God. It points his co-slaves or workers to God. It, and, and that Daniel does that with his life. He keeps pointing people back to God. It's not me that's interpreting these dreams. It's not me that's running this thing well. It's God. So it's, it's a great testimony. So these jealous men, there's nothing they can find. So you know what they do next? And don't be surprised if this happens to you. They attack his face. Religious persecution. Then these men said, we will not find any ground of accusation against this Daniel unless we find it against him with regard to the law of his God. Nothing to convict him of wrong, so they go after his faith. And folks, that's happening more and more in our culture, in the world we live in. People are being sued, literally, for their faith. I'm not making this up. You see it, okay? Not just other countries, but even in the U.S. Jesus said that people would hate us because of our allegiance to him. And we all generally want to be like, that makes sense. But we need to expect that at times, people will come at us and they'll hate us for no other reason that we belong to Jesus. And think about Jesus, okay? Jesus was absolutely perfect. No spot, no sin. And where did he end up? On the cross. So should we expect anything less than to face that kind of persecution at times? Well, look at what they do. They come up with a malicious plan. They collude together. We see that in verse 6. Then these commissioners and satraps came by agreement to the king and spoke to Darius as follows. King Darius, live forever. All the commissioners of the kingdom, the prefects and the satraps, the high officials and the governors, all have consulted together that the king should establish a statute and enforce an injunction that anyone who makes a petition to any god or man besides you, O king, for 30 days, no one should do this for 30 days. If they do, they shall be cast into the lion's den. Now, O king, establish the injunction and sign the document so that it may not be changed according to the law of the Medes and the Persians, which may not be revoked. Therefore, King Darius signed the document. That is the injunction. They come up with a plan that feeds off Darius's ego, his, his pride. And remember, that, 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 that sin of pride, it gets us in trouble so often. And we've seen in this book of Daniel what a big issue pride is for these kings, as, as well as for us. So they play into that because they know it's a human weakness. And they use this term, all. All of us have come together, all the commissioners of the kingdom. And that is simply not true. They lie to Darius. Daniel obviously was not a part of that plan. He never would have said yes. Uh, and, and, and they didn't, obviously, they didn't include Daniel because it was a plan to get rid of him. 
You know, folks, when someone says to you, oh, everyone is saying, okay, um, always ask who, specifically who. How many times have I heard we come together as staff and somebody says, well, people, da 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 I'm like, oh, give us names. Give us names, you know? Um, and a lot of times people don't have names or, or it's only one person. It wasn't all of them, but it was enough of them. And the king believes them and he makes a prideful decision. The plan appealed to Darius and the plan was basically that Darius would be the only go-between between the gods and humanity during that period. Everyone could only pray to him or through him. They fed his ego. So Darius unwisely signs it into law, a law that can't be altered. Okay, And that was the laws of the Medes and the, and, and the Persians. We see this in the book of Esther too. When a law was made in their culture, their custom, when it was written out, the king couldn't go against it. And we might look at that because we have kind of low view of kings. We don't have a king, you know? We rebelled against the king. You know, we don't have a high view of authority typically. We don't get the king picture in the scripture, which is throughout, because that's just not our culture. And we also have a low view of authority to the point, well, it's a law, just change it. We'll vote a difference or we'll take it to court, okay? That's how we roll, but that's not their culture. They had it this way that, that, so that the king would not lose his power or reputation to rule. If he was wishy-washy, he wouldn't be able to rule. So that was the law of the Medes and the Persians. And it was obviously a setup. But look at Daniel, and, and this is su super important what we see here. Look at verse 10. Now, when Daniel knew, Daniel knew, when Daniel knew that the document was signed, he entered his house. Now, in his roof chamber, he had windows open toward Jerusalem. He entered his house and he continued kneeling on his knees three times a day, praying and giving thanks before his God, as he had been doing previously. Daniel knew that this had been made into law. He knew the law, and, and, and Daniel knew what he was doing. He wasn't caught off guard. It wasn't like, whoops, I didn't know they passed that speed limit. No, he knew exactly what he was doing. It was a clear choice that he made. And the choice he makes here is to obey God rather than men. Daniel continued to do what he had always done. Look at those very important words, continued previously. He already had this as a practice. It wasn't something new in his life. He was being consistent. He wasn't flaunting his actions. Remember, they're intentionally trying to set him up, Some, something that they could accuse him of that would stick. And in doing what Daniel normally did, he now broke this new law. He was civilly disobedient. And there's a place for civil disobedience. God, we're not called to be rebellious people. We're called to honor those in authority over us. We're called to submit. God's set them up. But there are times when man's law goes against God's law, and you have to be really careful. We play around with that a little bit, or something gets passed, and we're like, well, I wasn't doing that before, but now I'm going to do it just to thumb my finger at the nose, or thumb my nose at the, at the whatever. I don't know. Whatever the phrase is, just to rebel. That's not what Daniel's doing. He's being consistent. You know, many Christians in Germany didn't stand up against what Hitler and the Nazis were doing, and, and they should have. Again, that, that new movie that just came out on Dietrich Bonhoeffer, this guy that was a pacifist, Christian pastor, that became convinced of what was going on with Hitler was, was horrible, and it, so it was. And he rebelled. Daniel could have done this prayer thing in secret and gotten away with it. But no, he just continued to do what he was doing, windows open, again, not flaunting it. He was bold. And we see that when he was a young man. He was bold as a young man when he had a lot to lose. And now as an old man, he's still bold with kind of less to lose. I mean, I've lived a long life. I've served. I've been at the top. But he just continues to go at it. Uh, as I said, God has continued to bring more and more young adults to the fields. We love that. Um, some of them are coming from my household, but there's others. Let me encourage you young adults. Know the word of God. 
Know what God is calling you to and be bold. Not jerks about it, just know, be faithful. I am so encouraged by this younger generation. I'm meeting some of these young people that know their theology, they know God, they love their neighbors. They're not jerks, but they're committed to sitting underneath the word of God. So encouraging. You know, there were Christians in the early church who refused to worship Caesar and they were brutally murdered. Okay? Just bend the knee, but in your heart, you know you really don't mean it, and they refused to play that game, and so they were killed. There's a magazine that um, it's turned into a podcast and all kinds of stuff. My mom subscribed uh, it to us when I was, I don't know, probably 15 years ago, called World Magazine, and it's, uh, it came out of a kind of a Presbyterian movement, but it's trying to look at the news from a Christian perspective, and obviously, everybody's biased. But they have this worldview that is trying to be Christian. And they're not perfect, okay? And, and they get things that are off. But I, I, I've, I've looked at it, and every year they have something called the Daniel Award. You know, Time Magazine will have the Person of the Year Award. The Daniel Award is they're looking in the world, not just the U.S., for someone who has made a legitimate stand for Christ and has faced the consequences of it. It's, uh, it's, it's, it's pretty cool. These people that have faced hardship or persecution for their relentless following of Jesus. I don't know if you've read recently or heard about uh, a guy named Adam Smith Connor in the UK that was arrested, literally arrested a couple years ago for praying, okay? He was arrested for praying outside of an abortion clinic in the UK. He's a father to a physiotherapist and a veteran who spent 20 years in the British military and he was found guilty just this past October of breaching the local government's public spaces protection order as he stood outside uh, an abortion uh, clinic and prayed. And, and he was in a very open area. He wasn't blocking anything, but he was praying silently to him, not to himself, praying to God, but no words out loud. He just bowed his head and was praying. And some off council members approached him and asked what he was doing. And after he told them that he was praying for his deceased son. He had been a part of an abortion years ago and in 2017 became a follower of Jesus and then became convinced of the clear teaching of scripture that life begins at conception. So he was just praying and he was told that his prayer was considered an act of disapproval of abortion and thus in violation of the buffer zone. And he was convicted in October and $12,000 fine. Praying silently, not being a jerk about it, plenty of room, not blocking anything. It's, it's a radical case because people are going, whoa, now the thought police, they're coming for us. Now, hopefully this doesn't stand. There's people trying to defend him, but you just go, are you kidding me? And Daniel continued to do what he had previously done. And, and here's the deal, and I'm going to go somewhere with an application for us, kind of right in the middle of our text, because I think it's important. For Daniel, he had already cult cultivated the ground of his heart and his soul. Folks, it's too late if we wait for persecution. The direction was set for Daniel, the, the power of a mind made up that, that helped him stand. And, and here's the deal. The spiritual disciplines, we did a series a few years ago here at the Fields, and we called it Cultivating the Heart for Growth. The spiritual disciplines, they don't earn us anything before God. They don't merit us anything, but they help set the ground. So when things like this happen, like with Daniel, our heart is ready to keep following Jesus in the difficult times. I'm going to put some words on the screen, and you might want to write them down in your program in a little list, because I'm going to ask you, not out of pride or arrogance or self-flagellation or anything, but to look at each word and kind of rate yourself one to ten, go, ha! How am I doing in these areas? There's many more words we can use, but I'm just going to put them up on the screen. We're going to leave them up there. There we go. And I just want to talk about each one of them. I'm going to self-confess some of my struggles in some of these. And, and the ones I'm doing great in, I probably won't say much about. But let me just walk through a, a few of, of these. Okay, prayer, because we're talking about prayer here. Daniel prayed three times a day regularly. It wasn't something new. It was consistent. We're not required to do this. He just did it. When I was traveling uh, years ago, I, I, I stayed in a kind of a youth hostel thing with a Muslim man. 
And, and that dude, man, he would get out and I, I don't remember, is it seven times a day that they pray towards Mecca? Five, five times, thank you. Five times a day, but this dude, man, we, we go to bed, he's praying. We wake up, he's praying. He's trying to figure out which way is Mecca. We are, I was in Hungary, he's like, which way, you know? But I'm like, wow, and I'm like, whoa, as a Christian, am I that dedicated? Not legalistically? For me, prayer is difficult. So I have to be more intentional. Wednesday mornings, if you're struggling with prayer, Come out with us, guys. It's a guy thing. Women pray here at the fields too, but guy thing, we stand at the beach, 6.30. If you can only come for half an hour, my son comes for 40 minutes, has to go to work. But we stand out there for an hour. I need that. It's not because I'm a stud, it's because I'm not. I need to be out there. And so knowing every Wednesday morning, I don't like mornings, but get up at, at 5.45, get down there in the cold. I hate cold. We pray. It's good for my soul. It disciplines me. I need that. Write it into your schedule. Our elders pray regularly this Tuesday morning. We're going to meet at my house at 6. We're going to pray from 6 to 8. We're going to be praying for you. We're going to be praying for ourselves. We're going to be praying for our church. I need these things in my life because I struggle with it. I'm one of those do, do, do guys, and, and, I, and God's working on me. I have a sabbatical coming up. One of the goals for that sabbatical is spend time reading books on prayer and praying. It's not that I don't, but just let you know, this is a struggle one for me. Okay, another discipline that helps us is, is Bible. God says, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. You know, even being a pastor, being in the word of God, sometimes is difficult or was difficult for me. I mean, I study like crazy, went to seminary, have a couple graduate degrees. I've always been reading Christian books and reading the Bible. But I've had to work at this one too. And, until not, not, not many years ago. Now, this... I just can't wait to get into the word. But I had to work at it. Some of you, it's easy. Some of you, it's not. Okay? Um, just being in that, so it's nourishing your, your soul. Are you feeding yourself or are you starving yourself? We have emaciated Christians that are not taking in the daily word of God. It, I look forward to it every morning. It blesses my heart. God speaks to me. He nourishes me. Here's another one. Learning to give of our first fruits, sometimes called tithing or giving. We see this prior to the coming of the law. Abraham, he has a great military victory, and he gives a tenth of, of, of the proceeds to Melchizedek, the priest. It's, it's something we see with Cain and Abel early on, this idea of giving of our first fruits. When my wife and I got married, we did not do that. We, I was working at a church for free, so giving our time. Uh, paying for youth ministry out of our own money, paying for expensive seminary. We got together with a Christian account and he goes, hey, you guys need to be giving 10% off the top. Now, that's not legalistic. That was just his thing. I'm like, yeah, but I'm paying all this money out to seminary. I'm working at a church for free. He goes, I don't care. It's like, okay. You know, and he challenged us. That got dialed in for us early on in our marriage. And so we've been able to do that and more ever since we've been, been, been through that. Some of you need to grow in that area. Just learning, God doesn't need your money. Folks, we pray about the finances here at the fields. Gosh, if the floodgates open, the staff we could hire, the gospel ministry we could do, some of the things we could do, gosh, that'd be so awesome. But God doesn't need that. He wants our hearts. Giving shows what we prioritize. Okay, serving. We, we talked a little bit about that. One of our values here at the fields, a biblical value is participation. God has gifted you to build up the body of Christ. Every one of you who is a follower of Jesus has a gift. So my question is, where are you serving? Not because we need you to serve, you need to serve for growing as followers of Jesus. What team are you guys on? Think about that. And we have tons of people that, that are on teams. It's awesome. Sabbath, okay, this is a hard one for me. And I believe it's related to faith. Remembering that everything is from God. And we need to learn to rest and let God be God. One of our elders, Jeremy King, uh, he does our biblical counseling, godly man. He gave us a book and um, it, it's about embracing our God-given limitations. We are not omnipotent. We are not omnipresent. We are not omnipowerful. We try to be, but we're not. And our phones really give us the illusion that we can be everywhere, that we can know everything, right? Uh, one of our computer programmers here said, you know, Google or God, Google or God. Where do we go? You know, we go to Google. No, go to God. But learning to stop and rest, that's an important thing. Not, again, in a legalistic way, a Sabbatarian way, but learning to know my work is done. God, God's in charge. That's a good discipline for the soul. 
Gathering, okay? The early church gathered regularly on the first day of the week to worship. And we're told in Scripture not to neglect that. Hey, I'm preaching the choir right now, because guess what? You all gathered today, all right? When I was, before I was growing up, my parents, old school, church every Sunday. I told you we'd be driving to New Mexico to visit my grandparents. We'd stop on a Sunday and find a church in a local podunk town and go to worship. This is what we did. It was almost a cultural thing. Well, culture has shifted. It got to be where people are going three out of four times, then two out of uh, of four Sundays, then one out of COVID kind of really messed that up. Folks, we've gotten out of it. It doesn't matter what the culture does. What has God called us to? Do you prioritize that? Dads, do you put sports, your kids' sports, over the gathering? And I got kids that have competitions on Sundays. You know, but what do you sign up? Do you sign up for the league that's every week? Or do you go, well, we can do it once in a while? Just, again, we need to think that through. The gathering, that's an important thing for strengthening So many important things there. You can say, well, it's easy for you. It's your job. You're paid to be here on a Sunday. Guess what? I wasn't always paid. And I love being with the body of Christ. And you guys do. You're here. That regular prioritizing over family birthdays. I mean, obviously, we take vacations and and things come up. And like I, I have children that have work schedules where they have to work. But are they gathering in their community group in that week? Are they gathering in their service teams? That importance of gathering, a a spiritual discipline. Let me just hit one more, and then we're going to round out this this account. What about sharing? Sharing the gospel, this good news. Um, The book we're reading by Matt Chandler, uh, he doesn't have this in there, but he was telling me, um, and he said this publicly, he wasn't a believer when he went to high school, joined the football team. He's a scrawny, scraggly little kid. and, And this guy on the football team in the locker room who was a Christian knew that Matt wasn't a Christian, and so he just basically went up to Matt and said, look, I'm a Christian, you're not. Are we going to do this now or later? I'm just going to tell you about Jesus. You know, just boom, right there, okay? Dude, that's me with the Uber, Uber driver. I'm just like, I'm paying you to take me somewhere. Um, I don't know who's captive, you or me, but I'm going to tell you about Jesus, okay? Um, are you in that habit? Our staff, every week, we go around the staff table. Who would you share the gospel with? Not for boasting, but for encouraging other, each other towards love and good works. Are you ready to have that answer for the hope that is in you? on on the tip of your tongue, not out of obligation, but if God really is good, don't you want to talk about him? I do. Amen? Yeah, he's good. He's good. Looking for those opportunities. Things like this were ingrained in Daniel's life before he was in trouble. So when trouble came, he just kept doing what he knew what was right, and he was going to let the consequences be the consequences. So Daniel, undaunted, continues to do what God had showed him to do. And was this out of pride or self-confidence? No, no. Go back to chapter 2, verse 27. Daniel answered before the king and said, As for the mystery about which the king has inquired, excuse me, neither wise men, conjurers, magicians, nor diviners are able to declare it to the king. However, there is a God in heaven who, and then fill in the blank. For Daniel, it was not self-confidence. It was a God confidence. And, and, and again, most of us would like to have that self-confidence so we might be able to feel a little bit of pride in ourselves, just like self-esteem, you know? We've been told that, oh, children's problems, it's because they have low self-esteem. No, it's because they don't understand who they are in relation to a God that loves them and wants them in his family. If you are loved by God, you have incredible self-esteem, God esteem. You're a child of the king. You're desperately loved. You get your value not from yourself, but from the God who made you. And so we need this God confidence that we have and uh, seen in Daniel here. Two of my favorite verses, I'm just going to do it again. Some trust in chariots, Psalm 20, verse 7. Some trust in chariots, some trust in horses, but we trust in the name of the Lord God Almighty. And then go to 1 first, first Corinthians 3. We'll read this. What then is Apollos? What is Paul? Servants through whom you believed, even as God gave opportunity to each one. And Paul goes on and says, I planted, Apollos watered, but it was God that caused the growth. God's the one that is doing this. Put our hope in him. So neither the one who plants nor the one who waters is anything, but God who causes growth. Daniel was anchored in this God. He was doing practices that kept him anchored in this God. So what happens next? Look at verse 11. Then these men came by agreement 
and found Daniel making petition and supplication before his God. Then they approached and spoke before the king about the king's injunction. King, did you not sign an injunction that any man who makes a petition to any God or man besides you, O king, for 30 days is to be cast into the lion's den? The king replied, the statement is true according to the law of the Medes and the Persians, which may not be revoked. Then they answered and spoke before the king. Daniel, who is one of the exiles, remember he's a prisoner from Judah. Daniel pays no attention to you or to the injunction which you signed, but keeps making his petition three times a day. Well, of course, these guys rat out Daniel. They're the ones that got the law passed. That's their whole plan. And it's working according to plan so far. King, remember you signed that law. Oh yeah, yeah, I did. Hey, there's somebody in your kingdom that's thumbing their nose at you. That's ignoring you. There's someone who has disregard for you. Now that's not true of Daniel. But Daniel was breaking this law. And look at the king's reaction in verse 14. He's bummed. Then as soon as the king heard this statement, He was deeply distressed and set his mind on delivering Daniel. And even until sunset, he kept exerting himself to rescue Daniel. Then these men came by agreement to the king and said to the king, Recognize, O king, that it is the law of the Medes and the Persians, and no injunction or statute which the king establishes may be changed. The king is bummed because Daniel's a a valuable employee. May we represent Christ so well in our jobs so much that our bosses would not want to let us go. Do our work as unto the Lord. So the king tries to figure out a way to get Daniel out of this. He sets his mind on it. He works hard on finding an alternative, a way to protect Daniel, but it's useless. And those enemies of Daniel collude again. They come to the king and go, yeah, king, remember, it's your law. You signed it. Remember, a little bit in in, in the king's face. It's a little bit shocking and bold that they would do this to the king. But Darius is stuck. So the king has to follow through. Verse 16, then the king gave orders and Daniel was brought and cast into the lion's den. The king spoke and said to Daniel, your God, whom you constantly serve, will himself deliver you. Now he says this, but look at the king's reaction. A stone was brought and laid over the mouth of the den, and the king sealed it with his own signet ring and the signet rings of his nobles, so that nothing would be changed in regard to Daniel. Then the king went off to his palace and spent the night fasting, and no entertainment was brought before him, and his sleep fud from him. He says, I know your God's going to deliver you, but he doesn't know that. And Daniel doesn't know that either. They're just walking into this thing with a sovereign God. But the king has no choice. Daniel has to be cast into the den of lions. And the den of lions was certain death. Now the king is hoping in the God of Daniel. And Darius has a confidence in this God, as as we'll see. But the king is, is really distraught about this. No food, no parting tonight, no sleep. Sleep. Would your employer lose sleep over you for the right reasons, right? Verse 19, then the king arose at dawn at the break of day and went in haste to the lion's den. When he had come near the den to Daniel, he cried out with a troubled voice. He's, he's concerned. He doesn't know what's happened. Odds are Daniel's toast. The king spoke and said to Daniel, Daniel, servant of the living God, has your God, whom you constantly serve, that got you into this trouble, not your God, but your service, has your God been able to deliver you from the lions? And shut the lions' mouths. And they have not harmed me inasmuch as I was found innocent before him. And also toward you, O king. I have committed no crime. Look how the king describes God here. The living God. A God who can deliver. The king actually had hope against all odds. He was troubled. But what was his hope anchored in? His hope was anchored in the God of Daniel. That's pretty pretty cool. A testimony there. And Daniel's reply. 
very personal. My God, not the God, not that God, not those gods, my God, his God delivered him and shut the lion's mouth. Incredible testimony. And I was innocent of, of this crime before God and, and for, before the king. And we know innocent people die sometimes. Christians before us have died in unjust situations. But God protected him. Verse 23. Then the king was very pleased and gave orders for Daniel to be taken up out of the den. So Daniel was taken up out of the den and no injury, whatever was found on him because he had trusted in his God. Then the king gave orders and they brought these men who had maliciously accused Daniel and they cast them and their children and their wives into the lion's den. And they had not reached the bottom of the den before the lions overpowered them and crushed all their bones. Wild. Not your bedtime story for your five-year-old, right? The lions ate them. They died. You know, uh, Gabriel, one of our church planners uh, in Africa, when he comes, Uncle Gabriel, he used to help my kids' stories. And they're always about lions eating monkeys and alligators or crocodiles chomping on, on birds. And it's like, oh, bloody stories, Uncle Gabriel. You know, my kids loved it. But the real deal is serious consequences for Daniel's accusers. And not just them, their families as well. And testimony, these lions were real. They weren't muzzled when Daniel was thrown in. He's pulled up, they're put in, they're toast. Okay? Wild. Well, verse 25 as we round this out. Then Darius wrote to all the peoples, nations, men, and men of every language who were living in all the land, may your peace be abound. I make a decree that in all the dominion of my kingdom, men are to fear and tremble before the God of Daniel, for he is the living God and enduring forever. And his kingdom is one which will not be destroyed. His dominion will be forever. He delivers and rescues and performs signs and wonders in heaven and on earth, who has also delivered Daniel from the power of the lions. Folks, this is your God too. Amen? This is who our God is. And we see that same kind of confession in chapter four of Daniel at the lips, on the lips of King Nebuchadnezzar. You know, I just think it would be kind of cool. We don't do a lot of this. We're not very good at it, but once in a while we'll do it. I think it'd be kind of cool if we did a congregational reading of those two verses right now, okay? So I'm gonna ask you, tonight. we'll have this, the verses back up on the screen, verse 26 and 27, okay? This could be turned into a song, but would you read that with me together? One, two, three. I make a decree that in all the dominion of my kingdom, men are to fear and tremble before the God of Daniel, for he is the living God and enduring forever. And his kingdom is one which will not be destroyed. And his dominion will be forever. He delivers and rescues and performs signs and wonders in heaven and on earth, who has also delivered Daniel from the power of the lions. Amen. Well, to wrap this up, look at verse 28. So this Daniel enjoyed success in the reign of Darius and in the reign of Cyrus the Persian. So encouraging. God was not promising Daniel he'd be delivered. Never along the way. They knew, Daniel and his friends, that God could deliver. Didn't know if he would. And here again, he does. For his purposes and for his glory. So what gives Daniel the ability to make this stand? It's not because his confidence is in himself but his confidence is in, in God. He was abiding in God. He was leaning on God. And today I just ask us, where is your confidence? What are you leaning on? What are you hoping in? Are you abiding in him? Or are you hoping in something else? Because we know hope in anything else eventually disappoints. But as we've been looking in this series, hope in God, that's what delivers. I'm gonna close by reading two verses to you out of Romans, kind of as a prayer. And then we're going to offer 
a time of worship, one more song. We have communion at front and at the sides. Simply take the bread, dip it in the cup. If you're a follower of Jesus, the bread reminds us of his body, which was broken, the cup, his blood, which was shed for the forgiveness of sins. Folks, these verses remind us of the gospel. You can't save yourself. You can't save yourself from Nebuchadnezzar, from the fire furnace, from the lions, from the authorities. Only God can save you. But the most important thing is God can save you from your sin. And that's the gospel. We could not deliver ourselves. But Jesus, through his death, burial, and resurrection, that's what delivers us. And that same love is what holds us. Romans 8, 38 says this, For I am convinced that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing will be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Amen.